how's everybody doing this morning? Yeah, yeah, so good to see each and every one of you again. We want to say uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to all our first-time guests. We're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're part of the service. You came to hear Pastor Eric. I am not Pastor Eric. I'm so sorry. I'm not, but he's going to be here next week. Him and him and Miss Crystal are taking a well overdue week off uh, from church. You know, right? Yeah. Somebody say, "Woo, Dad!" They need it. You know, it's been almost three years since they've actually taken a Sunday off. Can we put our hands together for the best working pastors that we know? Those guys work so hard. Hey, before we get into the preaching, uh, title of my sermon this morning is Praying by the Rules. So we're going to be talking on the subject of prayer this morning. And uh, I hope none of y'all checked out the minute I said prayer because I promise you it's going to be good. I promise you, right? I even asked myself, is it going to be good? And myself said, yes, it is. That's awesome. I was like, all right, all right, this is really going to be good. So with that being said, again, I want to do something before we get started. I want, to, I want us to pray for our kids who are getting ready to go into school. You know, we got kids that are getting ready to go into private school, public school, wherever school, and, and we want to remember them right now. And, and so you may say, Julian, I don't have any kids at home. They're off to college. They need it even more so. Right? So could we just take a second and pray for those kids, man? Just ask God. Because school's getting ready to start in about 11 days is what I've been told by my, my insiders. You know, about 11 days, man. It's getting ready to all happen. It's all about to go down. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can come to you this morning. And we're just so glad, Father, that you, you love us and you care for the things that concern our lives. And so today, Father, we specifically come to you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, asking, Lord, that you would surround our schools, surround our children, Father God. Thank you so so much for giving them a, a spirit and attitude of boldness, Father, as they go back into the school environment. We pray, Lord, that your angels would be dispatched from heaven to surround these locations when they're getting in buses and out of buses, going through buildings and, and into driveways, wherever they may go, Father, we pray your protection over them, their safekeeping, Father. And Father, we pray more than anything, Lord, that nothing would rob the value of your word from their hearts, Lord, as they go into the school system. We pray, God, right now, your blessings on this property and all the property that here in the Weatherford area, Father, that concerns our schools and, and the whole Parker County area. God, we pray, Lord, this, your blessing of protection over our children. And Father, we just thank you so much for each and every one of them. And we ask this in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Right on. Well, hey, I want to share with you a passage of scripture that I think you're all too familiar with. And then I want to kind of just break it down a little bit because, you know, some people say, uh, well, Julian, if I'm praying by the rules, is there really rules to praying? Can I just do what I want to do when I go to God if I'm sincere in my heart? And, and, and I would say yes, but I would also say no because, you know, you can be sincere, but you can also be sincerely wrong. Amen? And, and so uh, I, I, if any of you people... Uh, like any type of sport, and I'm, I'm using this as my analogy, if, if you run the bases in baseball and you come back after you hit the ball out of the park and you run the bases and you come back, what do they call that? Man, we got about five people who like baseball. The rest of y'all comment. No, you're not. You're not. <laughs> it's a home run, right? And so, so whenever you get, into, you get into a game where they wear the helmets and they wear the big pads and everything, they call that football. And the guy grabs the ball and he runs down to the opposite end and he crosses the white line underneath the goal. What do they call that? Touchdown. A touchdown. Yeah, exactly. And so here's, here's my point today why pr uh, rules are so important even when it comes to the spiritual matters of life. Because you can't make a touchdown in baseball. Right? The guy doesn't run the bases and he goes, touchdown! Yeah, they slap each other. You know how they get into all this slapping and, you know, all this other stuff, you know, and the chest bumping and booty bumping. I don't know if I can even say booty in here, but anyway, I said it. Okay, I'm done. I said it. I will never say it again. And so they do all this and nobody at the, at the dugout goes, man, what a touchdown! Why? Because there's rules. There's rules to everything you do in life, whether you like it or not. You were driving here, and there was rules dictating how you drive. Even some of you may want to repent later. <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity to do that. But, but there are rules out there on the road that says, hey, you know, there's a speed limit sign there, and you're supposed to follow those rules that govern the road. Right. Well, if we want to get a little bit more serious, there's rules that govern how we pray. I believe that sometimes you and I don't get the answers is because we're using the wrong rules at the wrong time. 
We have a desire to get the right answer, and Father God in heaven has promised he'd give you that answer, but we're coming at it the wrong way. And then we look at each other and go, well, the Bible must not work, and God must be a liar. But we already told here in the Bible that God is not like man, that he should lie, that he always speaks the truth. And so Jesus gave us this wonderful model over in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. He was, talking to his, he was talking to his disciples because they wanted to know how to pray, how to pray. In other words, there's a method of how to pray. And in the beginning in verse 9, and I'm reading from the New King James, it says there, in, in this manner, this is Jesus speaking, so we really want to listen up because Jesus is talking. He says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first thing I want to point out to you today, because I'm going to do what I like to call, uh, I call it peaching. You know, it's like preaching and teaching. So you have to kind of follow me as I go along through this. And so sometimes I'm teaching something and sometimes I'm just making a proclamation. I'm just declaring something to you. We call that preaching. And so today, I want you to notice that in that very first scripture, that very first passage, he says, in this manner. Jesus said, in this manner, therefore pray. In this manner. The word manner literally means system or method. In other words, there's a system on how you pray. There's a method on how somebody prays. How you approach God about the certain things that you need answers to. And then you allow God the opportunity and time to answer that. Because not all prayers, if you don't know this already, you're about to find out not all prayers are answered immediately. But then the flip side of that, I can say all all answers are immediate. But when they transpire and when they come into this earthly realm, may be a period of what we call time. Are you still with me? That when we pray, that when you and I pray and we believe that God can answer that prayer because we know it's promised to us. Kind of like the guy when he crosses the, when he crosses the, the, the touchdown line, he's guaranteed to get six points for his team. Why? Because he, he ran that ball and carried that ball according to the rules. And so therefore that qualifies him to receive the six points for his team. It's the same manner that when you and I pray, we need to take Jesus serious when he says, here's a method by which you pray. Not so much just repeating what we just read every time you pray, but reaching into God's heart and saying, God, I'm going to use your model, your method whenever I pray. So let's start talking about that process of when we pray, because I believe that God answers prayer immediately. Now, when it comes to light in your life, may be a period of time. And you and I, as his children, as his sons and daughters, must accept that reality. I loved it when my mother used to say, no, not right now. But then a week or two later, or maybe later that evening, she would boom. You know, when we, hey, I want an ice cream, right? You know, it's it's 10 o'clock in the morning at the grocery store with her. You see the... You know, you see that part, that's a, that's a gateway to hell, is that area right there where all the candy's at, right, that you're going through with your children, that's just a gateway to hell. Don't do it, kids. Don't do it, parents. Don't fall into that trap, you know, where they put all the candy right there by the register. Uh-uh. That's devilish. <laughs> just said it. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. But, you know, you, your mother, my mom would say, no, not right now. And my mom had a principle that says, if you don't keep bugging me when we're in the store, I just might make that happen for you later. And once I knew that, when mom would say, no, not right now, I was just like, "Uh, that's a strong maybe. Yeah, that's a strong maybe. And so I learned the principle that when I asked, standing in the grocery line, even though I got a no or a wait, did not mean that mom did not want to give that to me as a gift. Because then later on, we would be sitting down for evening family television time, and mom would just walk in there, you know, just nonchalant. Hey, by the way, who wants ice cream? You know, who's going to say no? And so I started seeing this connection. And so giving you that life story, you have to understand that one of the principles of prayer is that sometimes Father God will tell you no or wait. It does not mean a no, absolutely not. 
It's just that he always has your best interest in mind. You have to understand that as growing children of God, as sons and daughters, we have to understand that no does not always mean absolutely not. But on the flip side of that coin, when he says absolutely not, you and I must understand, Father, you always have my best interest in mind. Are you following me? And so when we pray here, we begin this prayer with hallowed be thy name. Or we could say, holy is your name. This is a prayer of reverence. This is a prayer that begins when you and I have the, you and I have the opportunity to reverence God. You know, dads, I'm going to tell on dads here. When my daughter would walk in and she would start buttering up old dad, right? Man, dad, you're nice. You know, walk in and I'm still in my pajama pants, my pajama shirt. She'd walk in the kitchen. Dad, those are nice pajama pants. Yeah, Yeah, something's up. But she would be very complimentary, and she would, she would, you know, very obey. Hey, Dad, can I get you some juice since I'm right here in the refrigerator? You know, Dad, you're awesome. Dad, are you losing some weight? You know, immediately I would suck in my stomach. Yeah, well, yeah, I am. You know, and she would just start complimenting Dad, and she would. It was always hard for me to tell her no. Dad, by the way, can I borrow your truck? Yeah, sure. She already had me all buttered up. How can I say no? Why? Because she came in there with reverence and, and praise to her dad. Dad, you know, this and dad, this. and Hey, dad, can I cut the front yard for you? I got that, dad. I, I got the lawnmower, dad. I know where it's at. You don't even have to tell me. I'm going to go take care of that for you right now, dad. She was reverencing her father. And so sometimes you and I have an opportunity to many times come before the father with reverence. Father, thank you for what you do in my life. Are you following? Father, I, I, I have some things I want to talk to you about, but first I simply want to recognize who you are in my life, your father. That's who you are, your father to me. You're dear to me. So I call you father. I call you dad. And so many times we miss our opportunity to receive prayer because not every time you come to God in prayer, it's an emergency. Your kids want something right now. You say, well, you don't have to have that right now. Remember the whole candy thing? You don't have to have that candy right now. I'm not saying no to the candy. I'm just simply saying right now is not the time for you to have that. But doesn't mean that mom and dad don't have the privilege and the right to give that to you later if they so choose to. See, there are times when you come in to God and you say, well, Julian, it seems like you're talking on two sides of your mouth here, man. You're telling me I shouldn't rush in, but I should come before the Lord in, in, in reverence. And I would say, yes, that's true. If you have your Bibles, if you'll just look with me We're over in the book of Hebrews, let me just turn over there, the book of Hebrews. Y'all don't mind if I read from my Bible, right? Mm. This is going down in my report. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let me get over there. Let me get to the right place. But in Hebrews 4, the scripture just came to mind here. So in Hebrews 4, the Bible says... Julian, don't forget your glasses. So here we go. Um, in, in, verse, in verse 15, no, 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Did you know that there are moments in your life where you go before God with so, so much boldness that you run in, prayerfully speaking, you just come in and say, Father, this is my situation, I need this. Father, you need to know how I feel right now in my heart. I'm feeling this anger. Can somebody relate to that? I'm feeling this anger, and God, I'm coming to you in full confidence. I need you to do something for me right now, and not next week. I need it right now. I need your peace to come and rest on me right now. That the Father recognizes the condition of your heart. And trust me, sir, ma'am, he knows you better than anybody. He knows you better than you know yourself. Boy, that was a hard lesson for me to learn, to find out that God knows me better than I know myself. So when I rush in, sometimes he allows it based on the condition of my heart. But, but more importantly, Jesus says the ideal way is for you to come to the Father in reverence. In other words, you set a time aside to say, Lord, Let's have a conversation because prayer was never meant to be a monologue. It was intended to be a dialogue. 
There are times when it's a monologue where you go in and, and, and just, just kind of shake your head if this has been you. you. You thought you were praying, but you were really griping. Yeah. There's none of y'all who ever done that. I must be alone then. So I've gone to God many times, and I was like, God, I can't stand it. That guy at work, I could choke him and send you to, to him for free if you asked me. Just let me do it, God. I would do that. You know, that kind of anger in, in a moment in life where you were upset about something that wasn't working out right, but you go instead to the Father and you ask Him, and then He lets His peace just come and rest on you. As Philippians told us, that peace that passes all understanding, that peace that will come and rest on you when you come to Him say, God, I am just so angry right now. Man, I could, I could bite a chunk out of that tree in my front yard. But you know what? I think it's better for me just to come to you, Father, instead and say, Lord, help me with this anger. Help me with the things I'm thinking right now about that other person. I'm laying it at your feet instead, Lord. There's moments when we rush in, but then there's many times the method that Jesus selected that said, hallowed be thy name. Lord, your name is holy. So let's move on a little further. The Bible goes on that says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is also surrender and complete allegiance. Surrender and complete allegiance. In other words, the toughest thing for you and I to do, and you don't have to say amen to this, but I'll go ahead and say it for Julian. Amen, because what I'm about to say is true, is that sometimes I have a hard time surrendering what I want to do versus what I believe God wants to do in my life. There's times when I want the direction of our lives to go this way, and when it doesn't or something, I hit a serious bump in the road, all of a sudden I'm mad at God, I'm mad at everybody around me because I'm in this situation, and it seems as though God doesn't care or nobody else cares, but I'm in this situation. I really need to, at that moment, recognize not my will be done, but your will be done instead, Lord. That whatever I'm going through right now in this season of my life, God, you want to help me through. Because in that process, you're going to also begin adjusting me and, and, and educating me on this situation in my life. I surrender to you, Lord. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Father, what's your plan for my life? So we went from reverence to saying, God, I'm surrendering to you. Because I got plans. I can come up with plans all day long. Proverbs 16 says this. You can go back and read it later, but Proverbs 16 says that man makes his plans, but it's the Lord who orders his steps. Wouldn't you much rather have God's steps dictated? In other words, you say, I want to go here, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I want to do that. And then God says, wait, uh, I'm going to use Adam back there. Adam, wait a minute. You want to do those five things and that five steps? Guess what? Five is actually two. But because you came to me, I'm giving you the inside scoop. Five is actually two. Three is really four. Isn't that even better? That even though I thought one, two, three, four, five, I do what Proverbs 16 says, God, these are my plans. But Lord, would you take those plans and order them in their proper place? So that way, every time I take one of those steps, perfect success every single time. That's the beauty of saying, Lord, I want your will to be done in my life. I want your will to be done in me. I want your will instead of what I think I want to do. So, Father, I'm coming to you to say, these are my plans. How would I organize those, Lord, so that I can have the greatest success, so that I might turn around and then praise you? Because I thought I had the right plan. When all along, when I surrendered my will to your will, you showed me really what the plan was. See the beauty in surrender? See the beauty in full allegiance to him when we say, Lord, your will be done. I know it's being done in heaven, but, Lord, I need your will done right here in the earth. Right here where I'm living, right here in the nasty now and now. I need it right now. And so then let's move forward. The next part of the prayer is a prayer of petition. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I like the idea of, of not having to hear a story again of somebody who walked into their successful position in their place of employment only to find out that the first thing they found out after they got their first cup of coffee is, oh, we're laying you off. Hey, we're letting you go. You know, we're not picking up your options. We're going in a new direction without you. Nobody ever likes to hear that story. Nobody ever likes to hear that, that type of thing. But when you and I pray Father, give us today our daily bread. The bread is basically a symbol of necessity. It's a symbol of what you need each day. 
Jesus told us not to care for tomorrow because tomorrow has its own troubles of its own. Focus on today. That when you and I go to the Father and say, Father, I woke up this morning, my eyes are open, guess what? I'm asking you to meet and supply all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I keep going back to Philippians, but there's where, there's where the reality is, is that really, Julian, do I need to ask each day, God, give me this? Let me say it this way, <laughs> and, and you may or may not agree with me, but I, I like to think you do, is that wouldn't it be something to find out at the end of life when you stand before the Lord and you say, yeah, remember that season in life when my life just seemed to unravel? And God looks at you and me and goes, well, you got up every day. You were so focused on the problem instead of me that you never came to me and asked me to provide you what you needed for that day. And so the next day was an unraveled day, and the next day was another unraveled day. You never figured out that I'm here for you each and every single day, and I know exactly what you need for every part of your day and for every part of your week. But if you'll give me the common courtesy as God to be your father to you, guess what? Just simply ask, and I will put things in their places so that way you have everything you need. Amen. I would much rather go to the Father in prayer and say, God, provide what Anita and I need today. Provide what we need. Provide what we need for this day, Lord, because you know what? I've already learned I can't do anything about yesterday because it's gone. I can't do anything about tomorrow because it's not even here yet, but here I am in today. So, Lord, provide for me and my family our daily bread, our necessities, what we need. There's nothing absolutely wrong with that prayer. It, it, God actually honors that in Jesus' model to teaching us how to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. So I'm, I'm petitioning God, and, and the prayer petition is really the prayer that I ask for myself. I did I ask for me and my, my family. That's a prayer of petition. Psalms 27, 13 says, I would have lost heart. This is David. He said, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have lost heart had I not seen the goodness, had I not believed that I could see the goodness of God in the land of the living. That means right here. You and I can be experiencing God's best. And you go, oh, Julian, you tell me you're not one of those name it and claim it kind of guys. I don't have to name and claim anything because it already all belongs to you and me as God's children. Everything God promised you in his word is yours. Just let the Father bring it to you when it's right. Amen. Are you with me? Do I need to say that again? Everything that God promises in his word is already yours when you become a child of God. But let the Father bring it to you in its proper time. Yeah. And so well, let's be like David and not lose heart in the meantime while we wait. While we wait. Am I being too serious here? <laughs> we okay. I know I want God not only to meet my, my, my basic needs, I want him to meet the needs supernaturally too. I need God's wisdom. I need God's understanding and insight. When nobody else has that insight, God, give me that insight. Father, I'm asking you to provide that for me and my family. Give us wisdom. Then instead of a left, maybe we're going to turn right here. You understand what I'm saying? And then, and then the next thing is a prayer of mercy. And, and, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. In other words, forgive us of our sin and, and, and as we also forgive those who might have sinned against us. There's another way we can say that. You say, really, do I have to really forgive every day if God told me he forgave me back then when I confessed him as my Lord and Savior? Do I need to continue? Yeah, because you keep making mistakes. Smile on you, brother. Yeah, you and I sometimes miss it. I don't know about you, but I still have a problem in traffic when people cut me off. I still don't blurt out, God bless you. May the favor of the Lord be on you. It's completely opposite, but we can't say it in church. And I shouldn't be saying it anywhere else either. But I still have a problem with that. Can I get some amens on that? If that's you, hey, hey, hey thank you. Yeah, I, thought I, I thought I'd finally reach you. But it's a prayer of mercy. We ask God to forgive us because, you know, you and I are walking out of churches and people are driving down the road and they go, oh, there's those church folks. You know that they automatically assume that you're perfect at everything just because you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ? They believe that you're perfect at everything just because you go to church every Sunday? Did, did you know that? Uh, that's a newsflash if it's not. They think that you're perfect at everything. One of the hardest things about being a believer in Jesus Christ is the world wants you to be perfect at what you do every day, but then they want you to be perfect also in the, in, in the things that they don't do every day. And then whenever you don't do them, they're quick to point them out to you. Perfection is a process. 
It's something that you and I are evolving into. God made us perfect on the inside when he saved us. He brought us to life in Christ because we confessed him as Lord and Savior. But then, then we start living out that salvation before the Lord. We start walking it out with our imperfections. And when we stumble, we get back up and we say, God, forgive me. But then, Lord, also, let me take it a little bit higher, Lord, because I want to grow in you. Forgive those who have sinned against me. Might have talked bad about me. Might have gossiped about me. Might have said something wrong about me. Might have, might have accused me of something I never did. God, I want to let them go too. We say in our house, Anita and I, when we pray, we refuse to hold grudges against anybody. You say, Julian, do y'all really do that? Do y'all really, do you successfully do that? No, it's a process. Yeah. But once the decision is made in our hearts, it comes out of our mouth. And we confess it to the Lord in prayer and we say, God, I choose to forgive I choose not to hold any grudges against anybody. Have I been wrong? Get in line, man. I've been wrong more times than I can count. I've been talked about more times than I can count. Just because I was a believer. Just because I said I, I believe in the Bible. I've been ridiculed on the job, in my family circle. You name it. It, it doesn't get any rougher than when, you, when they talk bad about you in your own family. And then at this moment, Jesus gives us this model and he says, Hey, can you let them go too? Can you just release them too? And so it's a, it's a prayer of mercy. I'm not only asking for forgiveness for my, for my own mistakes, but I'm also asking you, Lord, for forgiveness for those who might have sinned against me. James 5.16 says this, Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that, so that you can live together whole and healed. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. You know, I like to say it sometimes this way, is that the prayer of mercy without giving, asking for mercy without giving mercy is a failed prayer. Let me say that again. That when I ask for mercy but I refuse to show mercy and then I can automatically believe that God's not going to answer that prayer because God expects you and me to do the very thing to others that we're asking of him. So then when we say, God, forgive me, he says, I, okay, I can do that. But, but can you turn around and show that forgiveness to somebody else who might have wronged you? Can you start practicing on that? Because I really need you to work on that because as your loving father, I'll forgive you because you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, and I care about you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you mercy and I'm going to show you grace. I love you, but, but I really need you to be my representative in the earth, and I need you to turn around and do that to other people. There's where Anita and I got the idea that when we pray together, God, we, we refuse to hold any grudges. If somebody's talked bad about us, Lord, bless them. You say, are you kidding me, John? No, it's a practice. It's something we keep working at. God, would you forgive them who said that about us because we know that's not true? I choose to release them. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. The greater joy and peace you feel in your heart, the more you do it. And so I want to challenge you in that. And so then the next is a prayer of protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And sometimes people have gotten stumped because some people have said, does God really take you and, and, and lead you into temptation? Well, we know that's not true because that would be contradictory to what the Bible says that God tempts no man. So therefore, when you begin studying this out, you find out that the word temptation there carries with it a time of testing. A time of testing. A time of testing. Let me say that again. In other words, the Father reserves the right to see if you're, if you're practicing the things he's teaching you. You do it to your own children. Go clean your room. And the first time you go in there, you go, man, hmm, didn't do that great of a job. Let's go clean the room together. And then you do it again to your children as they grow. You trust them with a little bit more to see how they're going to react to it. And so with that, the father, the father's expecting you and me to, to have this, this idea that, that, that just as our earthly fathers tested us and trained us to do certain, certain things, our heavenly father does the same thing. So God, when you're testing me, help me to pass. Help me to pass, Lord. That when you're testing me and trying me, to find out if I'm, if I'm walking out this thing called salvation before you, I know that you won't lead me away to the evil one because you wouldn't do that because I belong to you. I already know that. So while I'm being tested, can, I, can you kind of help me to pass the final? Because, see, the Father reserves the right to find out if you're practicing principles of righteousness, holiness. He's going to test you sooner or later. 
and find out if you're going to look the other way. If you're going to go back in when they gave you more money than what they should have given you and you change. You go back in the store and say, hey, man, you gave me an extra $10. You could have said, ooh, the Lord done bless me. And you would have failed the test. He reserves the right to test you. And when he does, he does it in such a loving way that you might grow in righteousness. Not so he could lead you away and, and somehow take you back into sin because that would be contrary to who he says he is. That would make him a liar. And we already know scripture tells us he's not a liar. And so therefore, he reserves the right to test you. So when he tests you, I just simply want to pass the test, Lord. Protect me from the evil one. Protect me each day, God, and keep me from those things that would tempt me because the, the enemy already knows your weaknesses, but God knows the strength he's already given you. And that strength is found in Christ Jesus. I want to ask the worship team to go ahead and come up. I want God to be merciful to each one of us. I want God to be kind to each one of us. And so I, as I'm getting ready to close here in just the next few minutes, I, I want to I I share with you a couple of bonus thoughts, as I like to call them, because at the very end of the scripture, the, the Bible does say, uh, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isn't it wonderful to end your time of prayer and praise? To end your time of prayer and praise. You know what? When people rejoice, it's because they believe they already received something. You ever been to a meeting? I, I know I have when I worked for someone else. I would go in around Christmas time and the boss would call us all in. Nobody was more happier than being with the boss is when he's handing out the bonuses. Can I get an amen? When the boss is handing out the bonuses, everybody, all, whoa, boss, you are just awesome. Woohoo! We get all excited. Why? Because we're holding on to that money. We put that money in our pockets and, and we're all excited about it. And then, whoo, man, oh, man, you didn't see that bonus coming. Yeah, we got a bonus. Woo! Got the bonus. Woo! Boss, you're awesome. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, boss. You're so, you know, everybody wants to give praise. You and I are people of faith. We believe before we see. Y'all don't all shout me down. We believe before we see. You and I are trained to believe before we see. When you call yourself a person of faith, you're saying, I believe that God will answer my prayer, but I'm going to let God bring that to me in his season. And in the meantime, I'm going to believe it's on its way because I've asked according to his word. I didn't ask outside the confines of the rules. I didn't ask outside the confines of the promises that he's already made to me as his child. So then my prayer ends in praise because it's so important that you recognize the one who's blessed you with it, the one who gave you the bonus, so to speak, who gave you the upgrade. Why? Because you prayed back then and then God brought it to pass in your life when he knew you needed it the most. And so your prayer ends with praise. Why? Because you're a person of faith. You believe that when you prayed it, it went before the Lord and God went to work and making that happen in his proper season in your life. We pray for God to bless our children as we did earlier. I don't know about you, I'm expecting the blessings that my daughter needs to start coming into her life at the right time. He said, really, Joan? Yeah. I want God to bless my daughter in her marriage. I want, my, I want God to bless her with wisdom to mother the children in her life. Are you seeing what I'm saying? And, and I want that wisdom to come to her when she needs it the most. And so then we end our prayer in praise. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. I'm modeling it in front of you right now. God, thank you for hearing my prayer today. Today, Lord, as I go to work, thank you for having heard my prayer. Before I leave the house, Lord, thank you for having heard that prayer that I pray to you. As simple as it may have seemed, thank you for hearing it. And I praise you in advance for the answers that are coming into me and to my family's lives. Why? Because we chose to believe you. We chose to do things according to the rules. And so therefore, I have an expectation of good from you, Father, to me. And so here are the bonuses as I'm asking the, the prayer team to come up. Prayer team, if you would come at this time. Prayer should never be a plan B. Prayer should never be a plan B. Too many times people, I've heard people say, well, you know, you've seen it in the movies. I've even seen it in real life. You know, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. I guess all we can do now is pray. I guess all we can do now is pray. 
It sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like we're being real spirit. I guess all we can do now is pray. Prayer should have been the thing you started the whole problem off with. Excuse me for getting a little upset, but sometimes we put God in the back seat. We make him the plan B, and we try to trust men to do everything. And then we go, well, men let us down again. Let's get God, ask God, see what God will do about this. Prayer should never be a plan B. When problems arise, man, we ought to get on our knees. Figuratively speaking, we ought to get on our knees and say, God, I need you right now in this season of my life. Father, I need you right now. I'm praying first, not last, not second. And then my second bonus is this, as I said before earlier, understand that prayer is, is, is not a monologue. It's not just you talking. You say, well, Julian, how would I know God's speaking to my heart? Can I give you one key if you'll trust me in this? If you'll trust me in this, and I, I don't claim to know everything, but here's one thing I do know that I'm fully convinced in my heart because it's proven itself over the years. In the 35 years I've been a believer, it's been this, God sounds like me. When I hear that still small voice, did you hear me? It sounds like me. God will always lead you in the path of peace. He'll always lead you in the path of love. He'll never speak to you outside the confines of his word. When he speaks to you and me, he speaks to us in accordance to the rules. And many times that voice sounds just like you. That voice sounds just like you because his spirit speaks to your spirit that's been born again, that's been made new. And so it's a familiar voice. It's a voice that brings peace. It's a, a voice that brings contentment and joy. And that voice, I said again, let me I can't say it enough, will always line up with the rules. When it doesn't line up with the rules, you better go back to the prayer closet and say, Lord, did I hear you correctly? Why don't you go ahead and stand up with me, if you would. I already preached a little bit longer than I should. Why don't you just bow your heads with me, if you would, right now, if you don't mind. Just a few more minutes before we leave. I want to always give an opportunity, because I don't want to fail at my job. And my job is to always make sure I give you an opportunity to know Christ. If you're here with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, John, I don't know anything you were talking about. I've only heard bits and pieces before in the course of my life, but I've always wanted to know why my prayers don't get answered. Can I tell you with all heads bowed and all eyes closed that the possibility is that first of all, the very first thing you need is Christ in your life? You have to be part of the family. That's one of the guarantees that ensures an answered prayer is being part of the family. If you're here today, and you want to make Christ your Savior, would you just lift up your hand? I won't embarrass you. Just lift it up and put it right back down. Let me see that hand real quick. Let me see that hand real quick. If that's you today, because Jesus loves you, he wants to answer that prayer. He wants to answer that prayer in your life. If that's you today, just simply put that hand up real quick and put it right back down. Thank you. I saw that hand. Thank you. Let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. I receive your son, Jesus to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Today, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me, wash me, and make me whole. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me into your family and forever caring for my life. I receive the salvation that you freely give to each and every person who will simply ask, so I receive it now, and I thank you for it, and I praise you for it. Amen and amen. Here's one last thing before we go, guys. Uh, Colton and them are going to worship just a little bit. They're going to lead us in some worship. If you need prayer for anything, I want you to come up. Prayer team is up here. They want to agree with you in prayer for any single thing you may have in your heart that you feel like you need prayer about. As we worship just for the next minute, come on up. Go ahead, Colton.